Good evening. Thank you for all coming. It's good to see you. So um, I want you to do something very special for me. We're going to thank Stillwater High School for providing this great space. But we've got an award-winning theater department. And when I was in high school in South St. Paul, I ran lights, did set, did all kinds of construction so we can see, hear it for the volunteers for, and to thank Stillwater for opening up their space for us, but especially for the folks that are helping us with the lights tonight. Thank you so much. And don't forget when you go to if college, if that's the track you choose, it's great work study. That's how I paid for my part of my college. So. Um, it's uh, also good to be here with some um, fellow elected officials. You know, I served, uh, and I have the honor of serving you in the, in the U.S. House, but I also had the opportunity and the privilege of serving as a city council member in North St. Paul, right up Highway 36, and in the Minnesota House. And the one thing that we have to do, because you elect all of us, is work together. And so I liken it to, um, we all go to the same destination, and that's to get the job done for you, but we're in different lanes. And in order to get there effectively uh, for you, we have to uh, work together. So if they would just come up just for a second, Representative Shelley Christensen, Oak Park Heights Council Member Carly Johnson, and Mike, I didn't know you were coming, but I'm so glad you're here. So. Say hi for a second. Okay, hello. Thank you for coming on this lovely Minnesota autumn evening. Um, Betty, thank you so much for having me here. I'm Representative Shelley Christensen. I represent uh, District 39A, which is the Stillwater area, um, mostly along the river, Grant Township, Lake Elmo. Um, I just had half of my first term going, so I did drink from a fire hose for a few months, and I'm learning, and I'm, you know, proud to represent you, and let me tell you, I have a very, very close um, race coming up here, and so I could use all the help I can get. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Carly Johnson. I'm a city council person for the city of Oak Park Heights. And I think I speak for council member Runk, as well as the rest of our city, to welcome you to the city of Oak Park Heights. Thank you. So, so I only have one role, and I've, I've never had to enforce it. And the one role is that we are going to uh, treat everybody's comments and everybody's questions with dignity and respect. And so I've never had to enforce it, so I'm going to get started. Um, what I'm going to take a minute here is just going to uh, talk about some of the priorities I've heard from you, whether it's been at the grocery store, Target, town hall meetings, phone calls, emails, letters, and I still get faxes, um, that you're looking for uh, people who are going to be governing responsibly and creating opportunities for every American to contribute and to, to succeed. Uh, ensuring that everyone has affordable, high-quality health care, protecting public health, and that by that I mean making sure that our water is safe to drink and our air is safe to breathe, protecting our environment and our public lands, not only for today but for future generations, reforming our immigration system to be secure, just, and humane. Now, there was a transition. In 2018, uh, we saw some things happen here in Minnesota. Governor Walls was elected. Uh, Democrats took uh, control of the State House. You have a new state representative. You just met her. And in Washington, Democrats also took control of the U.S. House. Like in Mi Minnesota, the U.S. Senate, as well as the U uh, Minnesota House, are controlled by Republicans. But with Dem Democrats now in control of the U.S. House of Representatives, I not only have the honor of serving you as your representative, I have the privilege of serving as a chair of one of the 13 Appropriations Committee, and I chair the Subcommittee on Interior, Environment, and Related Agencies. So let me tell you what I work on. Um, we have a $37.5 billion uh, bill that we do, and uh, the Interior Department makes up uh, $13.79 billion of it. The Environmental Protection Agency is $9.53 billion. The Land and Water Conservation Fund, which many of you, I got 
that's probably the record-breaking letters I got was to support the Land and Water Conservation Fund, $524 million. The National Endowment for the Arts and the Humanities um, was uh, on there too. And the other thing that is in this, uh, um, a, uh, the agencies that, that I also have that are part of my full committee, um, it, it deals with tribal nations. So in our accounts, we f do fund schools, we fund um, hospitals and health clinics as well too, upholding our nation's uh, treaty and trust obligations. So um, a couple of things that I do as being uh, one of the members of the full appropriations committee, I also serve uh, as vice chair of the defense committee and I'm on the agriculture committee this year. But what uh, the Democrats have done is we have passed 10 of our 12 spending bills for FY20. We have passed them off the floor of the House, and we have sent them to the Senate. The Senate has not passed one, not one of its spending bills for 2020. And that caused us uh, in the House of Representatives to put forward what's called a continuing resolution, a CR, on September 19th. And it runs until November 21st. And the Senate passed it on the 26th of December. Had we not done that continuing resolution, we would have had a shutdown. I don't want to shut down. Um, that's why we got our bills done on time. We got them right out, sent them over to the Senate. So we are encouraging Mitch McConnell and the Republicans in the Senate to pass the spending bills so we can get our job done for you. The other, the other role I have as a committee chair is to do oversight. And that means I have to make sure that your tax dollars, when we're spending them on projects or fee dollars that you contribute to our national parks, that they are spent in a transparent and an effective way. And what happened during, and this is just one example of many battles I'm having with the Department of Interior, especially right now, but what happened during the shutdown is I had a conversation with um, the uh, acting secretary at the time, Mr. Bernhardt, and I said, we need to shut down our parks. We cannot have them open during the shutdown. The National Mall remains open. The uh, District of Columbia graciously picks up the garbage, but Yellowstone, you know, somebody, we don't have any park rangers there. It's not safe. We need to make sure that um, when people visit the parks, it's safe. And he agreed with me on the phone, and then two days later, I pick up the newspaper and find out that he's taken the fees. So if you go to some of the bigger parks, they charge a fee. He took the fees, which are clear in statute, clear in law, that are only to be used for auxiliary, uh, auxiliary programs. And I can get into the weeds on this. If it comes up in a question, I know it well. But I called up Mr. Bernhardt, and I said, Mr. Bernhardt, what you're doing with the fees to do day-to-day -day operation is not allowed by appropriations law, you have to cease and desist and do that because those funds are collected from people with, and they're obligated to do certain projects. Day-to-day -day maintenance is not one of them. And he um, explained to me that he was an attorney and he knew what he was doing and I said, okay. So I called the uh, Government Accountability Office, GAO. They're independent auditors and, and attorneys and I asked them to look into it and see if I was right and possibly Attorney Bernhardt was wrong. I'm not an attorney. And um, they came back and they told me that uh, Mr. Bernhardt was wrong. They issued something. They told them money had to be repaid back. But the answer has been from the Office of Budget and Management that where they don't agree with even oversight I'm doing on money, and other committees are doing the same thing, that OMB can choose to ignore the law. So we're, we're going back, and I'm going to continue doing oversight. I want to know where all the money's going, and that it's going to where it was directed. So another, uh, you know, you, you hear about nothing going on in Washington, and we will talk about the issue that's transforming our, our lifetime here in a minute. But um, you need to know that things are happening. I mentioned we passed the appropriation bills. So I'm going to go through some things really fast. I know they're in your handout. Since January 2019, Democrats in the House of Representatives have passed over 600 bills. 600 bills. And these bills are now sitting in the U.S. Senate. 
and there's no action taken. So for example, we have passed guns on gun violence prevention, bipartisan background checks, the enhancement of back check, uh, uh, background checks, combating climate change, the climate change take action now, which would put the United States government back in the Paris Agreement and, the, and it develops other plans. Um, protecting America's coastal and marine economies, which are really important. I mean, if, if the Senate doesn't agree with us, they can at least bring them up, debate them, and then, you know, vote them down if they want. But they're just sitting on a desk of someplace. Immigration reform. Uh, overwhelmingly, we hear from people all across the country that the dreamers, the children that who have been here, um, that they shouldn't be deported and that we should at least come together where, there, where there's agreement and do some uh, immigration reform for the dreamers. No action in the Senate, and as you can see, we passed that in June. Promoting cleaner elections and transparent government. Boy, do we need that, right? Um, we passed that in the House. Again, it's sitting in the Senate. Improving health care, something that we've heard from people loud and clear, and I know we'll probably get a question more on that, but um, right now I'm working to keep some of the protections in the Affordable Care Act where, where they belong, protecting you. For example, protecting uh, uh, people who have pre-existing conditions from losing that protection that's in the ACA. Working on lowering prescription drug costs. Now that at least, I'm gonna, you know, has gone to a committee in the Senate, so we're hoping at least one bill out of the 600 the Senate will take up. But then there's also a bill that we're working on now that we just introduced in the House, and we're gonna be taking comments and questions and, and hearing back feedback from you on, on how we can uh, lower uh, drug costs uh, now act, act. So there is no action on that in the Senate, we just took it up in the House. But here's some other examples. Raise the wage and protecting our economy. Paycheck fairness for, for women, for families. Um, no action in the Senate. Um, consumer protection. Uh, net neutrality is another uh, action item I hear from our constituents time and time and time again. We passed it in the House, no action in the Senate. And then uh, protecting uh, domestic violence, reauthorizing the domestic violence and protecting civil rights. Once again, some of these are just renewal bills, reauthorizations. We passed them and there are no action in the Senate. So I just wanted you to know that we have been working very hard in the House of Representatives. We have been getting our work done. We've been passing the bills to the Senate and now we need the Senate to stand up and take some action on this legislation, yay or nay. That's what we're elected to do. So I just wanted to give you an update. There are things happening in Washington. But I know and I can well imagine that many of you are here tonight on a topic that's probably the biggest story of our times, and that's uh, the impeachment inquiry that was recently opened into President Trump's actions. And I have to say, I take no joy in this. No joy at all. This is not what I signed up to do in Congress but it's part of my job to do accountability and to defend the Constitution. But what made everything so different in the past two weeks directs a threat to this national security of the United States. President Trump and I and some of the intel officers that you've heard referred to, we all take the same oath of office. And that oath of office is to protect and defend the United States. It's the Constitution, not the presidency. So I want to go through a couple of reasons why what has happened the past couple weeks has really changed the mood in Washington and why many of us are united in doing what we're doing right now. On July 25th, during a phone call with the president of Ukraine, President Trump sought to pressure the Ukrainian leader to take action to help the president in the 2020 election. By soliciting assistance from a foreign leader to investigate a political rival, President Trump puts our national security at risk. The inspector general of the intelligence community determined that the whistleblower's report was to be of urgent concern and that it appears credible. And that report should have come directly to Congress, but it didn't. 
And I'm going to take something from one of the unclassified uh, documents, and this is uh, from the whistleblower complaint. And I quote, I have received information from multiple U.S. government officials that the President is using, the President of the United States is using the power of his office to solicit interference from a foreign country in the 2020 U.S. elections. This interference includes, among other things, pressuring a foreign country to investigate one of the President's main domestic rivals. And that's just wrong. And it goes against the spirit of a democracy. <laughs> Why has the President's impeachment um, inquiry, you know, captured everybody so much? And that's because the Inspector General of the Intelligence Community defines, and I'm using statute in, in parentheses, urgent concern to be pursuant, and there's the code, and it is, and I quote, a serious or flagrant problem abuse, violation of the law, or executive order, but does not include differences of opinion concerning public policy matters. Foreign election interference threatens the national security of the United States, plain and simple. The Office of Director of National Intelligence, and I quote from that, election security is an endearing challenge and a top priority for our intelligence commu uh, com uh, committee, community. And they work on this very hard. We are being hacked into all the time. We are working to protect the integrity of your ballot. And I quote again, I can think of no higher priority mission than working to counter adversaries' efforts to undermine the very core of our democratic process. This is also from the whistleblower complaint. It's unclassified. And I quote, I'm also concerned that these actions pose a risk to U.S. national security and undermine the U.S. government's efforts to deter counter and foreign intelligence in U.S. elections. So what I put up is the impeachment uh, process up here. I used to teach social studies in high school. <laughs> Boy, I'm glad I paid attention to this when I was on high school and brushing up on it now. But that's, that, that, that's you can see what, what uh, can and cannot happen, and we'll have this up on our website too. But I want to quote, before I sum this up and turn this over to hear from you, I'm going to quote Abraham Lincoln. This is September 16th. 1859, President Lincoln. Our safety, our liberty, depends on preserving the Constitution of the United States. The people of the United States are the rightful masters of both Congress and the courts, not to overthrow the Constitution, but to overthrow the men who pervert the Constitution. And so that's where I am today on making sure that we have a full-blown, no holds bar, get to the facts impeachment inquiry. So with that, we have a couple of microphones set up and um, we can, what did we decide? Are we gonna have, why don't we bring microphones to people because some, some folks are more mobile than others. And so you can be our first question to bring the microphone over to you, sir. And then I can see a hand back here. And then because of the glare, and you all have halos, just let, just, just so you know with the glares back here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna let the staff work on getting the microphones out. If you could just give us your first name and your city, please. Richard St. Paul. Hi. First, I wanna thank you for taking a strong stand in favor of impeachment to save our democracy. And thank you for this meeting where we can express our concerns and ask questions. I've been active in political processes since 1968. Before asking two questions, I would like to very briefly express my concerns about the present threat to democracy in the impeachment process. Democracy is endangered because Trump and his collaborators claim unlimited power and that he cannot be investigated or charged with crimes 
and this has allowed him to obstruct constitutionally mandated testimony and fail to provide subpoenaed documents needed to investigate potential high crimes and misdemeanors. Trump has made clear his agenda for America through the following statements. The free press is the enemy of the people because the facts they report are lies. Those who disagree with his policies, report or investigate possible crimes are guilty of treason or are traitors and should be arrested. This is the same voice to me as fascist dictators of the 1930s. Trump has sequentially taken control of the Senate, which is afraid to challenge him and refuses to vote on House-passed legislation. The Justice and State Department, which is being used, utilized to investigate his opponents, he's taken over the State Department, or the Justice Department, which has done that, and the State Department is being utilized to investigate his opponents also. He has made significant progress in controlling the courts and the media. Call us authoritarian or totalitarian, but I use the term neo-fascist. Attempts are being made to weaken democracies and establish the same ideology all around the world. If he succeeds and is not removed from office by imp I'm almost finished. I'm over here, I'm a teacher. You know what I'm doing? Let's not interrupt people, okay? If he succeeds and is not removed from office by impeachment or an election, the American people should be afraid. If democracy ends here and internationally, history has shown that dangerous consequences will result. Unfortunately, one more statement here. Unfortunately, many voters remain disinterested or uninformed because Trump and his collaborators have used very effective propaganda techniques, utilizing statements containing ridicule or falsehoods designed to ca cause strong emotional responses of fear, anger, resentment, hatred, or even laughter in the terms of ridicule and listeners. And they are repeated over and over from multiple sources until they are believed. Questions? You used up your time. I'll tell you what. I'll answer the question by mail. Just, just write it and I'll take it, okay? Hi, I'm, I'm Doug from Stillwater. Um, you talk about things like rule of law. These are very important, but they're abstract. I think there's a strategic error going on here. Uh, the only way you're going to succeed in phase two of that impeachment process is to move the needle of public opinion. The way you do that is to come up with concrete examples of malfeasance, not airy, important, but still airy and abstract concepts like rule of law. Call that July 25th phone call what it is, extortion. And not even extortion for the good of our country, but extortion for personal gain. That's what we need to be calling attention to. Thank you, and that's, wh that's why you saw the House move to get subpoenas. And uh, Speaker Pelosi and Mr. Schiff and the Intel Committee, we're, we're, we're serious about this. We are, we're not fooling around. We're not fooling around. And if they don't want to give us the subpoenas, then we'll probably land up just ruling on contempt of Congress. Thank you. Hello, Betty. Oh, Hi. Joel. Hi. <laughs> Joel from St. Uh, St. Paul. One, uh, thank you very much uh, for being a representative who has open Q&A sessions with your constituents. We appreciate it. Second, um, I really, really am proud to have you as my representative. There's been great work done on issues uh, that you've led, things like Native American policy and now interior policy, so thank you very much. The question is on question is on health care, of course, um, and uh, we've done some nice incremental work trying to protect uh, some portions of the population in some ways on health care. It's time for a comprehensive overall fix for our health care issues. There is a bill out there, the Medicare for All Act of 2019. It has uh, 118 co-sponsors currently in the uh, Congress, and I'd like to uh, ask you to give it serious consideration. Thank 
you. Medicare for All is a great conversation to have. Medicaid for All is a great conversation to have. Excuse me, I've got the floor. You can raise your hand for the microphone. No one's going to interrupt anybody. Ma'am? Are you ready to listen? So the question becomes, how do we pay for it? Well, we're paying for people who are underinsured, and, and, and you, you, all of you here who have been working on this so hard know the statistics of how many people are still underinsured, how many people are still feeling hard choices. I mean, just, just look at what's going on with prescription drugs alone. I am on a different bill, and it's Medicare, not Medicare for all, but Medicaid for all. And I'll tell you why I'm on that bill over Medicare. It covers more, and like that, we can put people on it. It is an expansion of what has worked so well. You saw some of the articles in the, in the newspaper uh, lately about how we've got more people covered, more people are, are healthy. It's not as, as cumbersome and, and, and as, um, you know, starting from scratch to write it. I think we can still do more after that. But right now, my concern, and I think, I think many of you saw it, is the Affordable Care Act is under attack. This president is trying to remove pre-existing conditions, and he's trying to do it through the courts, the protections with that. So um, I'm focused on that. I'm open to other discussions. But I think the discussion that we could implement in, in the quickest and the most effectively is what we've already implemented in the states, and that would be not Medicare, but Medicaid for now. And it also covers more quicker and faster than we would have to rewrite Medi Medicare to cover. So I'm not opposed to it. I'm just not there yet because I don't think we're ready to put that in as fast and as quick. And I'm willing to take incremental steps on it. But I thank you for your question. And you just keep, you just keep on me on it. So thank you. Hello, Ron Detman from Stillwater. Um, my biggest concern is the budget deficit, um, and I believe the Democrats have to come up with a plan for both taxes and spending cuts. And for me, the biggest spending cut that they should look at is a 50% cut in defense, mainly closing the 800 bases overseas. And I guess that's my comment. My question is for you, what's, what's your plan to get the budget balance because the interest rate now is becoming, it's about 10% of the budget and that's only going to increase and health care costs are going up and defense is going up like crazy too. I mean it's more than World War II spending. That's ridiculous. We, you know, we can, we can defend our country and still say no to a lot of the things in the defense budget. And one of the things that you brought up is closing bases. And um, we actually, on the Defense Committee, will have people from the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Marine Corps come tell us, we're ready to mothball some places. This doesn't, this doesn't serve us anymore. We're paying to keep, I mean, we're paying tax dollars for rodent control in some of these places. There's no, one, there's no one there using it. There's just someone going in, checking things out. We can't even get some of the abandoned sites and, and, and look at, at, at better consolidation. And on top of that, we're not talking about what's going on with climate change and some of the bases that they're located. Some of them um, can't, can't remain there. We'll keep rebuilding them after every single hurricane and that. But there's so much we can cut back on some of the um, nuclear programs and that, that that the president wants to go, go forward with. We, we need to trim that budget, I agree. Military is 50, I mean, the 1% of the greenhouse gases in the world come from our military. But the Department of Defense, on the other hand, I, 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 I'm watching that, but the Department of Defense is one of the only places left in the United States government where when the Joint Chiefs of Staff come in and talk about climate change, they said, yes, this exists. So <laughs> at, at, at least they're being honest about that and, and working on some of that. Thank you very much for your question. And we can do so much more to cut defense. Hi, my name is Tom Wiesen. I'm from Montevideo. Um, 
The uh, bill was introduced this week in the House, H.R. 4464, the Ranked Choice Voting Act. Will you support that? Uh, I am not, you know, it, I think it should be on the ballot, and I think it should be for citizens to decide whether or not, not to support it. I personally, if it was on the ballot, wouldn't vote for it, but I'm not going to prevent something from going on the ballot. So that's an honest answer. I'm not, I'm not going to prevent it from going onto the ballot. I'm not going to prevent it from being brought up in committee. Um, I have it in, in the city of St. Paul. It's my choice whether or not uh, I participate in it. And just like some people like unit capital governments and term limits, it's on, on how you organize government. I appreciate that. And I think if people want to know more about that, do you have information? Did you bring information with you? Um, it's on the government website. It's which, uh, I'll give you a second, give him the microphone, I'll give him a second to plug the, the website here. Because it is something that a lot of people are talking about, but I think it's, I think it's a personal choice. You, I don't know exactly the exact website, but it was introduced in the House this week. So but, the, it, but there's a website for Ranked Choice Voting? No, the, the bill, Ranked okay. Choice Voting Act, we'll, was we'll, introduced this week. We'll, we'll, make, we'll make sure that it's out there so people can take a look. Thank you. Hi, right here. Yes. Yep, my name is Kevin from St. Paul. I strongly disagree against the impeachment of President Trump. And the reason why I think what's behind this, I work with, have worked with the late economist Lee Lynch, who correctly forecasted the financial collapse in 2008. We're on the verge of this right now, so they're willing to take over the presidency. To make, because Trump won't do what Bush and Obama did, which is bail out these banks. My main concern now, Mark Carney, governor of the Bank of England, and BlackRock and Wall Street have called for a regime change, uh, to saying that they should be able to print their own money or launch a new global currency. They said this. They're coming out publicly now. They know the system's bankrupt and coming down, and their allies and the intelligence agencies like MI6 and Britain, the CIA, they're launching a coup against Trump, a three-year old coup now, where you're wrong. Nothing has been done the last three years. Nothing. And you just gave, the Fed just pumped in an emergency overnight, about $100 billion the year last month. We're at the end of the fiscal year. And you, in your Congress, just cut NASA's Artemis program to land the first woman on the Mars by, uh, on the moon by 2024 which is an easily six, five billion dollars, and you gave another just a hundred billion to these creeps, um, these financial creeps. So are you gonna deny the first woman to land on the moon? That is my question. And are you gonna go along with this impeachment, which is a new fascist central banker regime instead? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, I think a woman on the moon would be great. I don't think we can afford to do everything all at once, can we? Um, but uh, I also, uh, I also uh, support moving forward with the impeachment inquiries. Next question. Next someone. <laughs> sir, sir, I'm going to ask you to be respectful because the next person was trying to talk. Thank you very much. I did. That was, sir, sir, she has the floor now. Sir, she has, she has, she has the floor now. Okay, go ahead. Here we go. Hi, my name is Susan. We are not going to talk to each other that way. Please, be, please, please be quiet, and I don't want anybody to speak rudely to anybody else. That's it. Sir? Okay, time's up, guy. My turn. Hi, my name is Susan and I'm from Stillwater. My question is, is, I don't understand, they receive subpoenas to provide information over and over and over again and they blow them off to, to, in terms of taking any action. What's the next step for having that, you know, if they're going to keep blowing everything off, what's the next step to take after you get blown off again? So we're collecting information, and one way you do it is by subpoena. There are also other people in this instance who are no longer working for the Department of State. So um, Mr. Pompeo and President Trump cannot tell them that they cannot come and they cannot speak. I think that we'll see what, what happens with uh, 
uh, being able to uh, work with uh, the former ambassador to Ukraine. She wants to speak to the committee. Uh, we'll see if they try to attempt to tell her she cannot speak freely. Um, and if, if they keep doing that, um, there's something called contempt of Congress. And it's, it, this is what I take no joy in, because the whole part of our democracy is checks and balances and that we respect the courts, we respect the executive branch, and the executive branch ex respects the legislative branch. And when there's a breakdown, and one side is you know, not forthcoming, and following the rules, um, then we have to call them on not following the rules. But I really hope, I really, really hope, I walk up every day an optimist, that um, the dam will break and people will start speaking freely under oath so that the American people can see all the facts in front of them. So that's my hope. Hello, my name is Tom. Thank you for the opportunity today. Um, I just wanted to speak about impeachment. I think we know that uh, ever since Trump was elected, starting on day one, Democrats talked impeachment. <clears throat> uh, their first big attempt was the whole Mueller uh, Russian collusion thing. Two and a half years, millions of dollars, total waste of time. So much didn't get done for the people just because they were after Trump on the Russian collusion, which turned out to be a total bust. What now seems like more of the same. Uh, <clears throat> you said, okay, here's some reasons for impeachment. One was the phone call. So when, you, when I listened to the hearing about uh, that Adam Schiff was leading, he got up there and told a bunch of lies. We saw the transcript of what the call says. Adam Schiff is saying all sorts of things that were lies that never happened. Uh, <clears throat> I'm wondering, I guess, two questions. First of all, if impeachment is so important, why isn't there a vote now? Why is this constant dragging out, avoiding a vote just so you can be pulling witnesses forward? It's not really an impeachment process. It's a, it's a delay of vote just for political purposes. And secondly, shouldn't someone like Adam Schiff, who lies to the people, uh, shouldn't there be an ethics uh, complaint within the House to deal with that sort of behavior? Thank you for your question. Thank you for your comments. I defend your right to say them, and I wholeheartedly disagree with them. Next question. Thank you, Betty. I'm Tom O'Day from the east side of St. Paul. And the laws that, that Trump has been uh, exploiting, like the National Emergencies Act and the International Emergencies Economic Powers Act and others, all have the same fatal flaw. They allow one single individual, the president, to make a decision that gives himself more power than he would ordinarily have. And I think you've got to stop that sort of thing and have multiple people, at least three, making that kind of a determination, two of which don't politically report to the president. And so uh, I'm asking you, I think the presidency needs to be contained, not expanded. So the whistleblower, the person who came forward in the intelligence agency, because so much of that is, as you can imagine, I put up unclassified documents. Um, I go to a lot of classified meetings, and there's lots of things I can't talk about. So to your point, the whistleblower was doing their job. There, there is a, there is, they go to a training. The people in the Intelligence Committee actually go to a training 
on what to watch for and what to do because they have a responsibility because most members of Congress don't know. Um, and if there's any kind of collusion going on at, at a cabinet level or something like that, which we don't know yet, but if there is, there needs to be a way for that person to come forward. So this check and balance needs to work. I think your idea of, of making sure that there's more transparency and more accountability is an interesting one, and I won't be surprised if we don't have discussions like that moving forward after, uh, after the next, next term. So thank you for your suggestion and your question. Hi, Congresswoman McCall. My, uh, my name is Sean Ryan. I'm, with, uh, I'm from Lake Elmo, Minnesota. And I want to pre uh, let you know I appreciate you coming out to do this town hall and, and uh, the tone that you're taking. I do not want to talk about impeachment, um, although it is very important. I am one of the few folks that are in here running for state office, and there's a lot of folks that are compelled to get involved because of what has gone on. Um, we hear the talking points out of Washington, and the Democrats say we want more affordable health care, and the Republicans might hear, you want me to pay for somebody else's health care. Mm -hmm. And it's just gridlock. You, you illustrated that very well. What I'm curious about is what are you hearing when you're in the halls talking to other members of Congress that are on the Republican side where you see there might be an opportunity for a break in the dam, a, might be an opportunity for bipartisanship, because we don't hear it in the talking points and in the news. So I'd be curious, what issues would you focus on to try to work on some bipartisan legislation? Well, that's, that's great. And there, there's, a couple, there's a couple of things that I'm working on right now. Um, Senator Murkowski from Alaska and I, as you can imagine, we probably do, uh, we don't agree on Anwar. But Lisa and I will get a bill done, and we will work together. And we will work together to fund the arts, and we will work together to, to do more brownfields cleanup, and we will work together to do other things. So we're going to have our disagreements, but we, we try to focus more on what we have in common to get the work done to serve the, greater, to serve the greatest number of Americans. That's our job, to get the job done. So we'll be working on that. But there's other things uh, that, that I uh, work on in my committee. So my, my ranking member, uh, who is from Ohio, David Joyce and I, um, we are constantly working to make sure that um, we do everything we can to stop invasive species, whether it's emerald ash borer or Asian carp. Um, so there, there's a lot of things. That they might sound like they're small, but uh, it won't be small to um, those of us who recreate in our lakes and rivers if Asian carp comes up here. Um, so those are some things in the Environment Committee that I'm working on. But I also just signed um, a letter with uh, two Republicans and another Democrat. Um, there was some foreign aid money that's used to help um, com um, uh, communities in Africa that are working to set up conservation districts and to make sure that villages can thrive and to work against all the poaching that um, is going on, some of it going to fund um, groups like Al-Shabaab and other things, just, uh, you know, the Chinese will come in and, and take what they want from rhino and, um, and elephants at times and, and kind of break down those cartels. And the Trump administration, for no good reason at all, wasn't going to let the funds that Congress appropriated that the President had signed into law moving forward. So we were working on, on freeing up uh, things like that. But I think one of, one of the uh, other letters I can talk to is I signed a letter, and many Republicans signed it too, when it came to the funds in Ukraine. We passed those funds in Ukraine because the Russian government had invaded a sovereign nation. We were working with our NATO uh, allies and European allies in the area, by the way, who are contributing significantly to um, making sure that um, Russia doesn't uh, come in, uh, in, in in that area anymore, uh, as they have in Crimea and, 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 and Ukraine. And we sent a letter. We said to the President, the Defense Committee, we talked to the Pentagon, why isn't the money gone out the door? They are waiting for these funds. The Russian government is breathing down, um, breathing down their necks with, with soldiers and, and, and other things that they're doing to disrupt the government and day-to-day -day life in Ukraine. Why isn't that money going out, Mr. President? We appropriated it, you signed it, and we got nothing back in a response. And I think that is another reason why this phone call and what was going on it has angered so many of us, because to take your tax dollars and to use them as leverage to dig up dirt on a political opponent 
is wrong, 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 wrong. Good evening. Um, my name is. No, you may not. Please. We are, we are trying to be as judicious as we can. There's lots of hands up. And as you can tell, I'm not filtering any questions. Yes. Uh, my name is Ron Malis. I'm, I live in Birchwood, Minnesota. And I have a question having to do with uh, intellectual property. Okay. I've dealt with uh, some patents in the past. I've dealt with uh, technical transfers going to China. And I'm kind of concerned in regards to how we're able to protect our tech intellectual property. Um, it's going to be used in the, in the Asia area. I don't have a problem supporting a transfer in order to do that. However, there's unfair practices that are occurring now in our corporations for a small inventor and stuff where they're taking those, they're making it impossible. We'll copy the, we'll copy the patent and it could be down to the, 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 the details of it. It may not match perfectly, but then the inventor itself is shortchanged in regards to the process. And there's presently a, a bill in the, in the House right now, and it has to do with addressing that. How do you stand on that? And how can we make it more uh, prudent? Because also, the copies that are occurring in regards to our own, like Amazon and stuff. In other words, the, the, they're marketing it back through Amazon and affecting mm -hmm. the small companies in America and inventors. So. so I hear a lot from um, businesses here in the Twin Cities and around the world that are very concerned about intellectual property right, everything from major manufacturing to small manufacturing to you know, s software and ways in which um, we can compete globally. It is a concern. I will find out if, if you can, when, uh, when you sign in or give us your name, we will get directly back onto you. You didn't have the bill number with you. We'll, we'll look it up. Inventors Rights Act, okay, we've got that recorded down now. But that was the one thing that I really thought that President Trump would, would really be, you know, there for us in dealing with China was on intellectual property rights. And instead, it's turned out to be a trade war that is hurting our farmers here in Minnesota. And that is something that, in my opinion, even hasn't been addressed very well when it comes to some of the pharmaceutical things in what they're negotiating right now between um, the, the new NAFTA, the USMAC. That, that, that's not even being addressed in, in, in there, too. I don't know why people are so silent about it. Maybe it's because we come from you know, um, a state that, that has made so many strides and do, done so many things with intellectual property, right? But to steal someone, it's property. To steal someone's property is, is wrong. We're seeing more companies start to put up more firewalls, more companies starting to return back here. But we can't also allow it to be a circle where if your idea and you're using it with a US manufacturer here, that that, that patent protection moves all the way through if it's stolen from that company. So I, I hear what you're saying. And that's, you know, why be innovative if somebody's going to take your idea? And we, the one thing we should need to be incurring in this country is more innovation. And I say that as a sister of an engineer. Um, so um, I, and I won't mention what company he works for, but I know that that's something that a lot of companies are very concerned about. And it doesn't, not getting the attention it should in the committees that it should. So I'm going to take a look in the bill and see if who the authors are and see if we can give it more exposure. Um, but those are things that I would like to work on, and so we'll follow back with you. Thank you very much for bringing that up. I'm Kate from St. Paul, and I just wanted to thank you for um, supporting the impeachment inquiry and also for supporting the uh, Saving the Boundary Waters. If we don't have clean water for our next generation, that would be a terrible thing to have happen on our watch, so thank you for that. 
Maureen from Grant, Minnesota, just west of Stillwater. Nice to have you here. Thank you so much, Congresswoman, for coming. Um, many of the issues that we're talking about here uh, to me seem as if they are examples of us being in gridlock. And I have believed for quite some time that there are three things that we need to do nationally and statewide and locally to get us over this hurdle of gridlock. One is getting the money out of politics. Mm -hmm. Second is getting rid of gerrymandering. Mm -hmm. And the third is something that was mentioned earlier, ranked choice voting. I believe that these three innovations could lead to an entirely different kinds of conversation, a very different kind of town hall meeting some years from now when they get put in place. I would look forward to sending you information on ranked choice voting. I thank Representative Christensen for her leadership in the state of Minnesota uh, on ranked choice voting, and it is an innovation whose time has come that can help us break loose from the shackles of this uh, terrible, terrible partisan poison that we've got in the water. Thank you. Thank you. Representative McCollum, it's nice to have you back home. Uh, in the middle of the night on August 7th, a truck with highly radioactive nuclear waste left Saskatoon, crossed into the United States, and went to South Carolina. I want to know if it came through the Twin Cities. Well, I think we'd have to contact the Minnesota Department of Transportation because those trucks have to be registered. Well, that's very serious because we know that the Department of Energy has shipped from Chalk River um, Laboratories in Ontario to South Carolina liquid, highly radioactive nuclear waste, the nastiest of the nasty, uh, down Highway 81, in fact, four miles from my daughter's home. And we estimate that about 100 trucks have gone back and forth to South Carolina. Uh, there have been incidents where the casks have broken and the shippers have not reported it to the authorities. We know that there are, there's permitting going on for Japanese casks, the, the, the container that holds the nuclear waste from Japan, Belgium, and Canada. Uh, there's a lot of shipping permits going on from LaSalle to Canada. Um, it seems like the U.S. is accepting a lot of other countries' nuclear waste, and do you know what the story is on this? And what, what are the risks of all the shipment, the plans for uh, intermediate nuclear waste, the attempt for us to open um, uh, Yucca Mountain? Uh, this is very serious stuff. It's very serious that we do something about our nuclear waste, as we're well aware of here in Minnesota that we have uh, both Monticello and, and Prairie Island storing uh, large significant amounts of, of nuclear waste. Uh, to your earlier question about a truck going through Minnesota, we'll uh, get you who you should contact in, in the Minnesota Department of Transportation, because it's my understanding that when um, something like that is, is going through that uh, people are notified of it, so we'll, we'll find out what, what number, and, and uh, because they wouldn't notify my office if they were doing that, so thank you. My name is Tim Worth. I'm from Lakeland, Minnesota. Uh, I'd like to thank you for being a voice crying out in the wilderness on behalf of the Boundary Walkers. And I'm just wondering if you could give us some advice on what we need to do to get other national politicians and state leaders to uh, get on the same page as you are. Well, the, th th thank you uh, very much. Uh, the Boundary Waters is the most visited national wilderness um, in the United States chain of crown jewels in our national park and wilderness uh, systems. Um, the uh, way in which uh, we've been trying to um, get information from the U.S. Forestry Service and the National Parks and, and, and the rest to find out, is, is sulfite mining compatible with the watershed up there? I think I know the answer. I think it's not. I think most science has proved that out. But we wanted to do our due diligence, make sure that we had all our facts in order, 
And so we had a study going through that the U.S. Forestry Service was doing. In fact, as the study was, uh, was, was moving forward, the then chief, uh, Tidwell, uh, basically said in his letter as he was doing the study, you know, this is of great concern to me that we would have sulfite ore mining, you know, within the watershed, of the boundary waters, because all of, all of these sulfite mines fail. They all have failed. And the devastation that they leave behind doesn't get repaired in a generation or two. It's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And then you add the threat of climate change on top of it, it, it would just, it would be a, a disaster that we can avoid. So we had a study going through and the Trump administration decided to cancel the study because uh, I could say this with some certainty because they just canceled two more uh, commissions that do research on the environment, including one of them on the health of our oceans. Um, they don't want any science when getting in the way of making a decision for, for, for profit. Um, so we're raising the awareness. Uh, you're raising the awareness by talking about it here. But I have to tell you, when I first started working on this issue in Congress, and we'd be talking about the boundary waters, I'd have members of Congress come up to me and go, well, why are we voting on a state park? And I said, no, it's not. It is a hidden gem in the Department of Interior. And it can't be hidden any longer, so we need to dust it up, shine it up, hold it up, and make sure people get involved in protecting it. It's starting to happen, but if you have friends and neighbors in other states, um, please let them know, and um, we just have to increase the effort on this. You know, we need it to be Yosemite, the Grand Canyon, Yellowstone, Acadia, oh yes, and did I tell you about the boundary waters? That's our, going to be our, my goal. That, that needs to be our collective goal. Thank you very much. Uh, Representative McCollum, my name is Paul Hart. I live in New Brighton, Minnesota. Uh, and you have, have mentioned a couple of times about uh, climate change. About 10 days ago, we had millions of young people uh, walk around the world to uh, campaign for helping the, the environment. A couple of things. Number one, there are going to be very well-financed forces that are going to fight this all the way. And you, as one of our representatives, is going to have to be prepared to go up against those forces. And we're, those of us who are concerned about the environment are going to have to help you. Number two, uh, Rachel Maddow has just published a book called Blowout, which documents in excruciating detail the forces of these very well-financed forces that are going to fight uh, these efforts, just as the tobacco industry did uh, for decades. So. What we need is very aggressive government action to uh, start to address these issues, but also we need an aggressive government program to help support the workers who are going to be losing their jobs because of the dramatic changes that are going to have to take place in our economy to actually preserve our environment for the future. We need to go to the coal miners, we need to go to the petroleum workers, and we need to have concrete job programs and training programs for them to help them make the transition to the new way of work and life for them. So, well no said. question, a comment. Well said. That's a comment, but to, to, just really briefly on that, the Blue-Green Alliance uh, is a group of labor and environmentalists who are working to think some of those very things out. And that goes to this gentleman's point here about protecting our, in, uh, our intellectual property rights. Because if we're going to be innovative and lead in this fight to create the next uh, opportunity for jobs, good paying jobs, and jobs that address what's going on with the climate crisis, we need to do it here at home and we need to protect those inventions. So I see you two go on hand in hand on when it comes to that. Well, it's 7.30, and um, we'll, we've got one more question over here. Yeah.
<laughs> now everybody's here, here. <laughs> Hi. Hi, I'm Steve from North Oaks. And picking up on the climate change, I don't think it, you know, climate crisis is our most important issue. And one of the things that's not happening is real action. Um, I agree with everything that was stated as far as the jobs programs and stuff. There is another thing, there is a uh, bill that has been introduced in the House, the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend mm -hmm. Act, that I think you're aware of, um, which is really for everybody else, it's a carbon fee with a dividend going back monthly to each individual. And when you look at the economics of it, and the economists' reports on it, it would be something that if we got it in, it would start to help the process. It's only one of many things that need to happen, but I would hope that you could maybe co-sponsor it, actually. There, there's been, uh, there's, there's two carbon bills that are that are moving, moving forward, and I think what we need is a blend of the, the best of both of them. And so I've been in conversations with both those, those authors on how to move, move that forward. And we do need to take action. Um, the climate, uh, we have a special task force that was formed after this last election. And um, they're coming up with um, a proposal. Um, my, some of the work that I do in my committee with some of the scientific research and some of the impl implementation that could happen uh, in our public lands. To, to, to see and to, to be carbon offsets in that. So I'm part of that, that discussion. So right now I'm not taking preferential treatment over one or the other, but um, I'm, it's, I'm, hope, I'm hoping and I'm pushing that we have something that we're out there talking about in the next election and that our next presidential candidate is talking about it too because it needs to, the ground squall's here. We need the next, per, the, we need the, the next person up in the White House to hear that. So thank you, thank you for your comments. So I'm going to close. I'm going to close. I'm going to close. As uh, I'm. Well, I was going to thank everybody for coming, and I mean it. Thank you all.